Some of you were here this morning and you will have heard um, Stuart Hacking from Emmanuel College um, speaking on this passage from John's Gospel. Um, we did have a chat with each other about whether it was wise to put the same reading in, the, uh, in both services on the grounds that everyone in the evening might fall asleep because they've heard it all before. Um, <coughs> I can reassure you, if you were here this morning, that I'm going to take a totally different angle on this, all right? And I'm certainly not going to tell any of the bad jokes that he told. <clears throat> but I will invite him back from time to time, okay? So there you are. So if you're in his fan club, please don't worry. It's actually um, more likely that you'll see him this year because, as I reminded him, there won't be any Sheffield derbies this season. But he didn't want reminding of that, as you can imagine. Right. <clears throat> Over the summer, we've been having a look at the I Am sayings of Jesus in John's Gospel, and we reached the end of that series tonight. I am the vine, you are the branches, is the last of those chronologically in John's Gospel. He said all of the others already in one context or another. When did he say this? What's the immediate time context of this? Well, it's the end of the Last Supper. And um, some people think that what was happening at this point was that Jesus, with this group of disciples who've been celebrating the Passover meal together, have moved off uh, on their short journey from the room where they were celebrating the Passover to the Garden of Gethsemane, where they are, where Jesus prays in John 17. And some people think, and I imagine they're probably right, that that walking journey would have taken them past some of the temple precincts in Jerusalem and past a number of large wooden doors which would have been carved with grapes and vine symbols uh, because, as we were reminded this morning, the vine in the Old Testament is a very powerful symbol of the nation of Israel. And the doors of the temple had these carvings on to remind the Israelites of passages like Psalm 80, which we heard read this morning, and the passage from Hosea that Mervyn read to us, where um, <clears throat> the idea of God bringing a vine out of Egypt and of this vine not turning out very well is, comes very powerfully through the prophets. And so Jesus, who at this point is only hours away from being arrested and being crucified, is with his disciples and he comes to an incredibly useful visual aid, something which he's going to actually try and get into their thick heads at this very important moment in history, in fact, and certainly in his life. And as they walk by and think about this symbol of Israel, which they knew so well, Jesus stops and he says, I'm the true vine, and my father's the gardener. And this is something which you guys, you disciples, need to hear at this moment. The reassurance is, of course, to those who've made a relationship with him, that they're the ones in whom the future is invested and not the rest of the nation who have rejected the message of Jesus very largely. But I think that there's a more serious reason as to why Jesus wanted them to learn about this at this point, and it's this. <coughs> There are, there are several ways in the New Testament in which the relationship between ourselves and God as, as God and his followers is described. The, the I Am sayings of Jesus deal with several of them, but uh, in, the, in the Western church, the biggest focus has usually been on the language about fathers and children. You know, God is our father, we are God's children, we are his sons and daughters. And that idea of as we become Christians and come into God's family, we gain 
a new relationship with a new father who is God. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But uh, because it is important to understand that uh, God is a person and that we are called into a relationship with somebody who can relate to us and who we can talk to and who talks back to us. All of those things are really important, but it's not the only model of a relationship that is talked about in the New Testament. They're all important. One of the I am sayings of Jesus is, I am the good shepherd. And so he talks about our relationship with God having similarities to the relationship that sheep and shepherds have. And that's actually an important lesson to learn because, of course, that was a very close relationship where the animals learned to recognize their master's voice and to follow and to find the nourishment that they wouldn't otherwise find in the desert land like Israel. And so, in the same way that there's something important to be learned from the father-child model of a relationship, there's something important to be learned from the shepherd and sheep model. Okay? Now, there's also something really important to learn from the model of Jesus being the true vine and saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. One thing that Stuart did say this morning is, if you look at a vine and say, you know, where does the vine end and where do the branches begin, you'll have a lot of trouble. Because these are not two separate things. The vine is one thing. All right? And they could see that that was true, and the vine dressers in Jesus' time would have known that very well. They wouldn't have been able to describe to you the scientific process whereby sap passes from the, the, the stem of a plant into the branches, but they knew that something like that happened because they had observed and they had noticed that if you cut off one of these branches from the vine, it will soon die. There's something vital about remaining in the vine. And so, <clears throat> when we think about our relationship with God, there's a sense in which it should be very hard to notice where God finishes and where we begin. You see what I mean? That God brings us into such a relationship with him that <clears throat> we derive life from him as the, the central section of this plant. But we are the branches. And of course, if you go looking for grapes or fruit on a plant, we all know where you find them. You don't go looking on the trunk or the stem. The fruit happens at the end of the branches. And so fruitfulness is, is, is something which God calls us to and wants us to enter into. And if we live in that kind of relationship with him, fruitfulness should just come about. I once uh, you know, heard a preacher trying to, to say, you know, you don't hear... Um, sort of groans and sounds of effort coming out of plants trying to bear fruit. You know, you go out into your garden and you expect to hear or something like that. You know, plants trying to bear fruit for God. You know, he says it doesn't work like that. You know, it happens. It's how growth happens. Now. I think Jesus is clearly suggesting to the disciples here that this is what really should be happening. And as well as being sons and daughters of God, and as well as being sheep in, uh, in the care of the great shepherd, we think of ourselves as branches in the vine, and we learn to live day by day, drawing strength from the vine in that way. It's a bit like, you know, there's no solid line drawn between God and ourselves. 
that we're expected to live in such a way that we draw strength, sustenance, grace from God who is the vine. And that as branches in that vine, we begin to bear fruit. And the New Testament talks about the fruit of the Spirit as being love, joy, peace, and all of the things that are listed there in Galatians for us. And that that just happens. We don't need to make an effort to do all of those things if we are truly related to God. And I think that um, at this at this key moment in his life, only a few hours away from the crucifixion, this is the lesson that Jesus is trying to get into the heads of the disciples. They will need to learn to live as his disciples, not with him there physically, but as branches attached to the vine, drawing strength from God for all that they need day by day. And he makes a very, very interesting statement in the middle of the passage, which we've read for years, but the church has ignored. He says in verse 6, or is it verse 6? No, verse 5. Apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. The church has really translated that over the years as... Apart from me, you might make a decent fist of it. But he doesn't say that. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And if we've ever wondered why there was so much futility in the world and in the church, perhaps that's the answer that Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Which is the reason why, <clears throat> at the beginning of every day, I've tried over the years to get into the habit of saying, Lord God, you know, will, you, you know, will you come by your Holy Spirit on me today? You know, I can't achieve anything today apart from you. But I thank you, Lord, that you want to give your Holy Spirit to me uh, so that I can operate as a branch of the vine, drawing strength from you, bearing fruit, which happens because I'm attached to you. And it's quite clear that uh, Jesus is trying to get into their heads also the idea that the only way that they won't bear fruit for him is if they separate themselves from him. And of course, they've just lived through the experience of Judas leaving the room and going off to betray all of them. You know, was he trying to say something about that? I think perhaps he probably was. So, apart from God, we can do nothing. And it's the last thing, one of the last things Jesus said to his disciples before the crucifixion, something which probably struck them with such force on that occasion, certainly the Apostle John, that years later when he came to write it down in the Gospel, he remembered it very clearly as one of the things that Jesus had said at this point and associated it with the life of God, with the vine and the branches. So I think that's the key lesson to remember from this passage, as well as remembering that we are sons and daughters of God, which of course is a tremendous privilege. We must remember that we are also branches in the vine and that we should be on a day-by-day basis drawing strength from God in the way that the branches draw sap out of the vine and begin to bear fruit. And if we've ever worried too much about, you know, what fruit are we bearing for God, perhaps we should sort of worry about that a bit less and just ask the Holy Spirit of God to work more powerfully through us each day. I was actually quite challenged when I read that passage that Mervyn read to us earlier, which is a passage about how Israel, the vine, in the Old Testament didn't quite measure up and 
uh, and actually God in that passage tells them that if they keep on doing that, they're just going to be taken off into exile in Assyria. And so it proved to be. But <clears throat> as, he, as he challenged them with that, God also put out, uh, did you notice that he puts out this call at the end of the passage? You know, so to yourselves in righteousness, he says, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and pours righteousness upon you. And as I read that, I wondered whether this was just a, a message for the present for us. I don't know. Break up your fallow ground. What might that mean? That, you know, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Let us pray that we may start to seek the Lord in that way, remembering that without him we can do nothing, that he may pour righteousness and grace upon us.